In this episode of Between the Lines, Nanjala Nayabola, a Kenyan activist, political analyst and author, speaks about her fascinating book, Digital Democracy, Analogue Politics, How the Internet Era is Transforming Politics in Kenya, about how the digital age and social media has impacted Kenyan politics and the consequences for democracies across Africa and beyond. While the impact of the digital age on Western politics has been extensively debated, there's still little appreciation of how it has been felt in developing countries such as Kenya. Reframing digital democracy from the African perspective, Nanjala's groundbreaking work opens up new ways of understanding the current global online era. Interviewing Nanjala is IDS researcher Tony Roberts. Nanjala, welcome to IDS. Thank you. Thanks for making time to come and talk to us. I have to say the book really gripped me from the very first page. Um, It deals with some really complex issues in what's been a turbulent decade for Kenyan politics. But you succeeded in dealing with those subjects in a very compelling and accessible way. And I read the whole book in a single weekend. (laughs) And as you know, I ended up live tweeting chapter by chapter as I read it. Um, So we know Kenya well for its leadership in digital mapping with the Shahidi in 2007. um, And more recently with mobile money in with M-Pesa, but we're less familiar with the use of digital technology in Kenyan politics. Mm. Now, your book is titled Digital Democracy, Analog Politics. Can you summarize for us what its main messages are? Right. It's really, honestly, the book is about a collision. And it's about a collision between, I guess, Kenya's schizophrenic personalities, these two personalities, these two faces of Kenya that are constantly in this push and pull. And the digital face of it is what a lot of people would have encountered, for example, in magazines or in the press here in the West, which is um, you have the quintessential image of the Maasai with the mobile phone in his ear, which is that there has been this unprecedented uptake of digital technologies, both in the private and the public sphere. And you've mentioned Mushahidi, um, M-Pesa, mobile money in general. Kenya is the number one leader in mobile money in the world. I think in 2016, mobile money transactions were equal to one-third of the country's GDP. And you, but and then there's other things like the elections, right? The fact that we had a massive uh, digital election in 2013. Everybody notices 2017, but actually the introduction began in 2013. And the fact that the two major political parties in 2013 invested obscene amounts of money in their digital social media internet campaigns because this was becoming a really potent political space. So that's the digital side of it. And the analog side of it is the side that resists transformation, that resists change, and wants to keep the old way of doing things um, because there's so much profit and there's so much both economic and social profit to be made from keeping things the way they are. And that is, you know, corruption, and that is manipulating elections, and that is a government that doesn't want to relinquish control to a new generation of political leaders, to a new generation of political participants. And the way I see it is the last 10 years have just been a push and pull between these two faces of Kenya. And sometimes one side trumps over the other. So we have like Ushahidi and M-Pesa, but also just... Um, the way people are mobilizing online, winning for a certain bit, and then the other side kind of figuring out, oh, I can't let this get out of control. I must also resist that. And what I'm trying to do in this book is to try and situate this, these um, clashes, this collision, and to leave it at the point where I don't know what's going to happen next, and I don't think anyone really does, but to point out that it's not as simple as giving a society more technology and saying, well, now everything's fixed because these two sides are not on the same page. Yeah. You, you mentioned that the obscene amounts of money that were spent during that election, and I want to come to that now because when we're told the story of the effect of Facebook, Twitter, and Cambridge Analytica on politics, the dominant narrative generally concerns events in the global north. Mm-hmm. So can you tell us how those same technologies shaped governance and democracy in Kenyan elections? Yeah. It's, it's really one of the underlying themes um, that I have in this book, which is to connect what's happening in this one African society, country, not just to other African societies and countries, but really to the world. 
I'm not sure that enough people are aware that the tactics that were being used by Cambridge Analytica in the UK vote, Brexit vote, and in the U- US general election were first tested in Kenya and in Nigeria and in South Africa, that there have been political parties who have invested a great deal in, well, number one is harvesting information from social media users, um, whether it is through seemingly benign um, games, seemingly benign um, surveys, interviews that are actually harvesting user information, um, whether it is tracking, uh, understanding how people respond to different news or things that people uh, place. So, for example, there's a practice that's well known in public relations called uh, building a smoke screen, which is exactly what it sounds like, that if something bad happens or the government is in a bad news cycle, what they do is they either encourage or they even start their own hashtag, their own conversation about something that seems really benign, right? Like, um, here's a picture of a cute dog or here's a picture of a man standing in line eating a, a githeri out of a bag. It's like, oh, here's githeri man. And this this actually happened in 2017 that when the stories about the second election Oh, no, the stories about the first election in August were getting out of control. Suddenly, there's this hype cycle around this man who was drunk and was eating Gideri out of a bag and was standing in line um, to vote. And that man actually ended up winning national honors. It just became this massive, massive hype cycle. And in the process, you stop asking questions about ballot stuffing. You stop asking questions about um, the head of ICT, you know, dying two weeks or being murdered two weeks before the election. And so... Um, Things like that, right? So the behavior, the ways in which states, the ways in which governments manipulate um, public opinion and public conversation online, these are things that have been tweaked and tested in other parts of the world before they're re-imported back to the West. And I always make sure when I say this that I'm not saying that these things matter only because they will eventually affect Western countries. They matter in their own space. Like It matters that a British PR company, um, by local reports, uh, the Jubilee administration, which won the Kenyan election, spent $6 million on Cambridge Analytica alone. That for, matters. For 10 days' work. For 10 days' work. I mean, that... Uh, in contrast, the estimate, um, the local uh, estimate was that each presidential candidate spends $5 million on their entire presidential run. So we're talking about money that could actually, it's make or break. But we're also talking about stakes that are very unusual in their specific context. And I'm thinking right now, not about Kenya, but about Nigeria and how Cambridge Analytica's involvement in the anti-Buhari campaign and stoking anti-Muslim um, sentiment in Nigeria, it's not just about winning or losing an election. People might die, you know, if in the context of local politics in, in Kenya as well, you know, things can escalate very quickly and people will die. And there's moral ethical questions that need to be asked about should Western corporations be free to be that involved in election campaigns other parts of the world and where there is no legal framework that can say actually you are culpable if this leads to someone being killed or someone dying. Um, those are the kind of things that I, I hope that the underlying theme of connection uh, brings to the fore, that the world is not an, a set of isolated data points, that we're all connected, and things that happen on one side of the world can easily affect us on the other. So you mentioned uh, how technologies were used to, to fan the flames of ethnicity in Nigeria. I mean, in the United States, in the UK in Myanmar, in India, wherever we look, we've seen the use of social media used to amplify ethnic divisions and mobilize violence for political ends. So can you tell us about the use of digital to exploit ethnicity for political ends in Kenya? One of the things that, well, my favorite question that I've gotten so far in talking about this book was always, what didn't you put into the book? Because the conversation on ethnicity and how technology is intersecting with ethnicity, I do go into it quite a bit, but there's so much more to be said. And I think the one lesson that I I would have loved to have more space to explore was what local language radio can teach us about social media. Because local language radio was a big part of the ecosystem that made the 2007 post-election violence in Kenya possible. 
was that we had gone from having one national broadcaster in English and Kiswahili um, to having 178 radio stations broadcasting in multiple languages and a regulator that did not have the capacity to listen into all of those conversations all of the time. And so people were being fed this menu, this um, menu of hate speech over multiple, multiple, multiple years. And indeed, one of the people who was indicted by the International Criminal Court um, for incitement was a radio presenter. And that just speaks to how much um, radio had come to represent this information manipulation, this misinformation ecosystem that made violence possible. And Kenya is not the only example of this. You had it in Rwanda, um, in, you know, with Radio Milikolin. And um, because, again, it's reach. It's the fact that 78% of Kenyan households have radios. And so there are lessons there about information silos about talking to people who already agree with you, about advertising, because it really does come down to advertising and people trying to sell you things by convincing you that you are unique as their listener. You have unique characteristics that do not translate to other ethnic groups, for example. And so for me, what's happening on social media with ethnicity, and we talk about ethnicity, as you mentioned, it's not an African thing. That's what we're seeing right now, right? We're seeing this um, identity question is not necessarily, quote unquote, primordial or, you know, ancient rivalries or whatever that language is. There's something about the human condition that wants to build community outside the family. And there's something about how that intersects with information that makes it a very powerful and potent thing. And like with Kenya, a lot of what happened on social media, and especially with WhatsApp and Facebook, replicates what we saw with local language radio. That is information silos, that people are only talking to people that they already agree with, that people are sharing information that hasn't been verified, that hasn't been tested, that ha has, there's no fact, you know, it's not based, it has no basis in fact, that it masquerades as news, right? It has the patina of news in the sense that it has like the websites look very fancy, like a news website or whatever, that it has, it speaks to a very unique characteristics of the person who's receiving the information. So like we had a campaign called the Real Rayla campaign that was run almost entirely on social media in the 2017 election. And it was basically a YouTube video, a couple of Facebook pages and a couple of memes that were spread on WhatsApp that would say that if you voted for Raila, that there was going to be anarchy in Kenya, the main opposition leader, that he was going to turn Kenya into a war zone. And it was very all very dire and high production value, etc. But not everybody got those messages. The messages were being sent to people who checked off certain criteria. And what a lot of people don't realize, for example, on Facebook, based on what pages you like, based on what advertisements you click on, based on who you speak to, they're able to glean a really significant amount of information about you and your preferences and send you advertising based on that. And when political campaigns are able to feed into that advertising ecosystem, that they're able to pay to send messages to specific people, then we start to see the kind of problems that we've seen over the last couple of years, not just in Kenya, but around the world. Because the basis of political discourse has to be that we're all consuming the same information, even if we disagree about what that information is and what it means. But if I'm consuming information that you're not consuming and we're both going to the ballot, you know, on the same day to decide about the future of the country, then we end up with the kind of problems that we saw in 2017, which is we're not reading from the same script. You can't argue with people. You can't have political debate or discourse between people who are not reading from the same script because they're all convinced about the absolute rightness of their of their position. And then what are people going to do after that? That's, that then becomes the question for the political scientist, which is each society is going to respond to that very, very differently, but all will be negative. It's just going to be a question of extremes, you know. So one of the, the more positive pleasures of reading your book was the focus on the positive agency of Kenyans and their use of digital technologies to, to challenge orthodoxies. So can you give one or two key examples of that? My favorite 
thing to have to witness over the last couple of years has been how women especially have been using a radical feminists have been using social media to organize and i do have an account about how you know the the mainstream women's rights organizations have become captured by the political system and therefore stuck in this um discourse this it's all it's very disempowering discourse about who women are and who women should be and i give the example in the book about the leader of the Mindeleo Yawanawake Association which is the largest women's rights organization in Kenya who went on television and said i'm only a feminist until i get to my front door when i enter my house i leave the feminist of the feminism at the door and i become a wife and mother and it's <laughs> it's such a bizarre moment to 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 encounter because what she's suggesting is that feminism is incompatible with being a wife and being a mother and that is something that radical feminists in Kenya are rejecting there's very little space for radical feminism in the public sphere in Kenya there's very little space for people who challenge traditional family values and especially lesbians especially you know people who are parts of sexual and gender minorities won't find representation in the public sphere at all prior to the social media era. But what we're seeing right now is movements being built. You know, we are 52% is one of my favorite examples. It starts off as a hashtag but actually has a very significant offline component because there are meetings, there are people who are showing up lobbying state because the constitution of Kenya provides that not more than one third of the any public body should be made up of more than of of either um gender so uh, right now every single public uh, every single arm of the legislature in Kenya is unconstitutional as is the judiciary um and is the executive the senior executive and so we are 52% as a point of mobilization by radical feminists by women to try and draw attention to this issue and and to change the conversation from women being given benevolent favors from the patriarchy you know here you can have an extra seat to saying we actually demand representation because we are 52% of this country's population there are similar examples with lgbtqi community with the rafiki film that was another great moment of social media giving a platform to an organ to a group or to a class of kenyans that wouldn't otherwise be heard from in the traditional public sphere and i i spend a lot of time in the book talking about media because media is a big part of the problem or the 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 challenge i guess that people face and it's important to understand media capture because the internet has a surrogate function in every society that reflects what is missing in that specific society so it can be a networking function it can be political mobilizing function it can be a site of political resistance all of that because there's something that's not happening and so in kenya it's the retreat of the media the traditional media from the public sphere with censorship with self-censorship with lack of funding with all of that and the internet sort of coming in as a surrogate space for that and especially for people who wouldn't find space in the traditional media and grabbing that space and turning it into a really powerful story of agency and and recapturing narratives. Right now we have a a litigation that's going through the courts in Kenya that is trying to repeal section 162 of the penal code which is the one that provides that homosexual acts are punishable by 14 years imprisonment um automatically. And they've had almost no coverage in the traditional Uh, the people who are running the case in the traditional media a lot of people wouldn't know that this case was happening but if they did it would have been framed as a question of morality right this is an immoral versus moral conversation because of the space that's been afforded by the internet now it's a conversation about human rights and it's a question about dignity and it's a question about what kind of society do you want to live in that to me is a really powerful thing because it's retelling a story about a section of Kenyans that most Kenyans would not really have known about before. Great. Your your book does a, a great job of going into that kind of depth about the the agency of Kenyans and I and I hope people will listen to this and want to go and read that book. But right now I want to kind of widen the angle because you're an international correspondent and and policy analyst and so whilst you were writing this book you must have been also visiting many other countries and seeing both similarities and differences. So so tell us please what what is common of these themes across the countries that you're familiar with and what is distinctively Kenyan 
One of the things that really struck me was, well, first of all, internet shutdowns. Kenya hasn't had an internet shutdown yet, but it is something that was very much, the fear was there in 2017 that at some point they might shut down the internet and what would that mean and what that look like. They've been, this is, uh, even in 2000, by the end of January 2019, there had been five internet shutdowns in, in Africa. And I think that because these are happening, especially in smaller countries with smaller internet penetration, there isn't enough attention given to how to support people who are experiencing those internet shutdowns. And there's not enough investment in developing tools to help people circumscribe the shutdowns because it's mostly activists who are are on the wrong end of this. I'm struck by the differences, the reason, part of the reason why we feel, we, those of us who work work in this policy space, um, we suspect that there wasn't an internet shutdown in Kenya was because of the amount of public functions that have shifted to the internet. So Zimbabwe kind of found itself at the beginning of this year with this, of 2019 with this tension because they shut down the internet. But one of the currencies that's in use in Zimbabwe because of the currency collapse is RTGS, which is real-time gross settlement, which is basically interbank, internet-based money transfers. And so they basically made people more poor. Internet shutdowns actually made people more poor. Um, And you see this in uh, Uganda as well, that the taxes on the internet were supposed to be a method of curtailing the presence of the internet, but have actually had really significant economic outcomes for the Ugandan, the Ugandan economies taking a hit. And so there are all of these lessons about how far is too far and, and how should we think about what the internet is for. Basically, right now, I think that's the big main question that a lot of countries are going to have to ask themselves. What's the Internet for and and how should it be protected or whatever? But I also want to mention um, Germany because I found Germany to be a really interesting case about how a country can demand differential treatment. Because in Germany, for example, with Facebook, all every other country, Facebook is the moderators, the content moderators are in the Philippines. Regard almost regardless of what language you speak, they just got their first um, Amharic, and there's one person for all of Ethiopia who does content moderation in Ethiopia, in Amharic. She's not in Ethiopia. But Germany said, no, if you want to run Facebook in Germany, you have to do your content moderation in Germany. Same thing to Twitter. If you want to run Twitter in Germany, you have to make it impossible for anyone to see Nazi, to share Nazi imagery on Twitter. So you you can have a, a Nazi post that was created in the United States and put on Twitter, but as a German follower, you cannot see that post. I find that to be a really fascinating example of the fact that these tech companies are not immovable. And for the right amount of political pressure, they will make the necessary concessions. And that gets me thinking about various African countries with the election conversation. Um, and, and how do we have a policy environment that makes it the protection of African people as much of a priority as Germany has made the protection of German people? And I don't know what the answer is to that off the top of my head, but I just, I think it's something that we really need to think about. The fact that People's, the idea that this is Facebook and this is how it has to run is not true. This is Twitter and this is how it has to run is not true. There actually is a lot of room for agency even within that conversation. It's just another orthodoxy. It's just another orthodoxy, yes. So finally, mm-hmm. are you optimistic and what do you hope for? Oh, so you end with a hard question. I don't know if I'm if optimistic is the word that I would use. Every time I'm about to resign myself to the fact that we're sleepwalking into a nightmare, I see an expression of agency and an expression of um, solidarity that changes my mind. I think overall I'm apprehensive. I think that more people in I will say Kenya for the purposes of this conversation, but certainly in the world, I think more people need to be thinking politically about the internet. That it can't just be that tech is tech and it's its own thing and it's a quote-unquote morally neutral thing because it's not. 
I think we need more humanities in the tech conversation and we need more um, human psychology, sociology, all of that in the tech conversation because we are really heading towards a nightmare. Uh, panopt- an op- especially like in Kenya, Panopticon, that's run by a government that has no interests, no citizen interests um, at heart. But then I think about how young people, how activists in Madare in Kenya used WhatsApp to document police violence and made it impossible for the police to deny that there was a door-to-door campaign that was happening at the, during the worst of the violence in 2017. And I think about how um, they're building websites to keep track of extrajudicial executions and to hold individual police officers accountable for these executions. These are expressions of agencies that are small in the context of the national, international conversation, but would not be happening otherwise. So I guess to me the challenge is how do you balance our concern for all of this state-driven stuff that's really out of control with enabling this agency, this grassroots one person, two people, one community group, three community groups, um, agency on the other. And to me, that's the interesting policy conversation that I think we need to be having moving forward. It sounds like pessimism of the intellect and optimism <laughs> of the will. Yes, I'll accept that. <laughs> Nanjela Nayabola, thank you for spending time thank with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thanks for listening. If you like this, then please subscribe and share. Follow us on Twitter at IDS underscore UK or visit IDS.ac.uk.